Hello everyone, Alistair Gold here. Feels like maybe we're starting to get somewhere. Maybe. I don't want to get my hopes up. But it feels like things are starting to happen. We've got a Tottenham Hotspur victory. Quite an important one to talk about. And also, Tottenham are <laughs> about to sign a new player. The reason I'm so reticent in actually even completing that sentence is because I've got a feel for poor Everton who thought exactly the same thing. Um, and this very player looks to be heading now towards Tottenham Hotspur. Um, oh, there's so much to talk about. There's so much to cover in this one. So apologies if it goes on for a while. Um, I've got to fit a lot in. We've got uh, Danjuma, Poro, um, Conte, Kane, Paratici, Levy, um, Emerson, and many others. Um, we're going to kind of talk about in this as well. Let's start with Danjuma though, because obviously that's the the pressing subject right now for everyone. Um, it's actually yeah. Start of the window, which I think when I said it, it would have been either start of the window or just before the window. I can't remember which it was. But I said the priorities for Tottenham were going to be a right wing back and a an attacker. So the attacker looks like that will be sorted uh, within the next 24 hours, you'd hope. Because as I film this, um, Arnaut Danjuma is going through his medical at Hotspur Way. Um yeah, I mean, it's the med medicals have so many different parts to it that it's expected to kind of go on into the night. So it may be that when this is actually eventually publishes, because YouTube does take its time to upload stuff, so it might be a little while. Uh, so it may be completed by the time this is done. But uh, it was definitely underway um, and had been since early evening, late afternoon. It kicked it off at Hotspur Way. So... If you're not aware who Arnold Danjuma is, uh, Villarreal attacker. He was at Bournemouth a few seasons back. Um, he had a terrific season last season. I'm going to talk about all his stats in a little mo. Um, I, uh, the reason I say I absolutely feel sorry for Everton, and it's because this comes from a place of experience with Tottenham. We've seen deals that were almost done get absolutely snatched away, and this is what's happened to Everton, so I've got masses of sympathy for them. It sounds like the deal was all, almost pretty much done for them. I think it was a straight loan deal. Um, he'd done his medical. I think most of the stuff had been signed. I think, from what I understand from some people, that maybe he'd even done the media stuff for them. But I can't confirm that's definitely true or not. But it certainly sounds like everything had been done and dusted. It was just a case of registering him. And suddenly, here he is at Tottenham Hotspur doing his medical. Um... It's not a nice side to the game, but unfortunately, it is what happens. You know, obviously, it's going to be the player's right to, to pick where he wants to go. Um, yeah, I'm. It's it's it is a really interesting deal. If I'm going to purely look at it just for a second from the player's perspective, I can understand Everton are a bit of a mess right now. I think you know I know a lot of Everton fans, especially Guesty people. Know I do the podcast Golden Guest Talk Tottenham with Guesty. Um, and he will be the first to admit that Everton are a bit of a mess right now. Obviously, no manager right now either. Uh, languishing down the bottom of the league, or at the, at the bottom, kind of lower reaches of the league. And I suppose you look at Spurs and you think, you know, chance to work with Antonio Conte. Um, Champions League football as well, coming up next month. Um, you know, they've got a realistic chance if they push on from last night to, to get back in the top four. And, you know, potentially, um, you know, something more comes of what is expected to definitely initially be a loan transfer. So I get that side. But I also, from a playing point of view, I would have thought Danjuma Everton would get a, quite a lot of game time. Um, and it also sounds like Anthony Gordon may be heading off potentially to Newcastle, which means that Danjuma, if you're not aware, plays either on the left or he can play up front. Or he can actually play as like a support striker. That's the best way to put it. Uh, someone, you know, yeah, support striker is the best way. Let's stick with that. Um, so I think he would have got a lot of game time at Everton. Whereas at Spurs, there's a lot of com competition for him. Um, especially on that left, you've got Sonny and Richarlison both there. Perisic can play there as well. 
Uh, through the middle, of course, you have the club record goal scorer, joint record goal scorer, Harry Kane. Um, yeah, there's a lot of people that he's got to try and leapfrog over in the pecking order. Um, it's gonna minutes are gonna be tough for him. I actually think it's probably a better deal for Spurs than it is for the player because I think as a squad option, you know, we're gonna talk about some of the stuff he's done, and I do think as a squad option, he'll be a very handy person to be able to turn to, whether it's to put straight in the lineup for various players or whether it's from the bench to change games. You know, he's big and strong and he's got an eye for goal as well. So, yeah, it's. Um, I do think it makes more sense from Tottenham's side than maybe it does for the player. But hey, that's, that's not my decision to, uh, to uh, you know, that that's him and his agent. That's down to them, I guess, and, and working out what's best for them. So, some of these stats. Um, scored this, this season six goals in 17 games. It hasn't been quite as good a season for him as last year. Last season, he scored six goals in 11 Champions League games alone. Um, and he scored 10 goals in the Liga in 23 matches. So 16 in 24. Um, obviously, Villarreal reached the semi-finals and they had a cracking season. And he had a really good Champions League run as well. So he's got a lot of experience um, now in the Champions League as well, which is another... Oh, Conte's always talking about experience, so he certainly has that. Um, he turns 26 on transfer deadline day, I think generally 31st. So he's not a not a young, young player at all. Um, it is worth noting, guess he pointed this out to me because I'd forgotten, that he is now, he Spurs have 17 on the dot foreign uh, or locally trained players in their Champions League squad. So Danjuma's arrival will take them over. So someone's either got to accept that they're not going to play in the Champions League or someone's got to leave in the next week um, among those 17 players. So that's an interesting little thing to keep an eye on. A little side note, as it were. A little subplot. Um, so yeah, that kind of will uh, will definitely uh, play some role, you'd think, in the way Spurs look at, um, at any outgoings in the week ahead. Um yeah, the other thing with Dan Jim, uh, Dan Jim, he does also, like I say, play for Bournemouth. So he's got an experience of English football. Um, he went there from Club Bruges. Didn't have, he was quite young, obviously. Premier League, I think it was 14 games without scoring a goal. However, when they went down Bournemouth, he was pretty good for them in the championship. I've got his numbers here. 17 goals he scored in the championship for them in 35 matches. Helped them reach the playoffs. I think he even scored a couple in the playoff semi-final as well, but they they um, obviously didn't uh, yeah didn't get through, did they? On that on that occasion, um, I'm trying to remember now, I don't think they did. Um, yeah, so English experience knows the physicality of the games. Had a couple of seasons in England before, so it's not going to become a shock to him. He, he, he there's less adaptation time. It's very much a able to play now player I would say um, is it the most exciting transfer in the world no no I don't believe it is but you don't we don't really know I mean if he, if he shows the form he did last season for Villarreal then it could he could end up being a very clever um, I was gonna say purchase loan at the moment it looks well it's gonna be a loan either way um, at the moment as I'm filming this, and this could all change, but at the moment as I'm filming this, it, the suggestion is that there could be uh, an option to buy inserted as well. What I would say with these loan deals, we've had a few in the last couple of years where there's been an option included until the very last moment, and when the terms are finalised, the option dropped out. So it's one of those, uh, if, if there's any aggregators desperate to chuck out bits and pieces, it's probably not worth it. Because, you know, like I say, what I'm told is there's an expectation there is going to be one. But that's absolutely no guarantee that when those uh, when that deal is announced that, that it ends up being in there. Um, it's really not. So, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, aggregators. Um, some of the uh, some of the uh, the smaller aggregators have uh, been giving me fun in the last couple of days. Was it today? No, it was today, the latest one. Because I... Uh, did 5,000, well, just under 5,000 word talking points, about 4,000 words in. I just mentioned uh, a little bit next to Porro 
that you know at this stage it's still you know still kind of 50 50 it's very much it's one that could go either way in the week ahead but there has been a little bit of progress on it and obviously the aggregators took that bit out and put that out as a tweet and um yes obviously understandably People go, well, this isn't news. Why is this going out? As if like I'd written a whole story based on the fact that a transfer might or might not happen. I didn't say that. That was not the... Well, I guess I did say that, but I said it right kind of down the end of an article, just mentioned and it, there isn't really an update in that regard other than there's been a little bit of progress because there is a feeling that um, Sporting are now coming away from their insistence on it being a... Um, pay up the all, all up front release clause. But we're going to talk about Poro later anyway. But it just reminded me when I spoke of aggregators, I had to leave all of it. The leave conversation is such an amazing element of Twitter. Um, I now use that for pretty much everything that I don't want to be spammed with notifications for, especially when it's something that kind of isn't quite presented in the way I originally intended it to be. But it's fine. It's all part of the game. I get it. It's all part of the Twitter game. Um, but back to Dan Juma. Um, is he mostly excited? Is he the most exciting transfer ever? Probably not. Is he one who instantly commands a starting spot in the team? Probably not. Could it be a clever move for the rest of the season? And then potentially, if he plays well, and there, that option does stay in there, um, or is it finally you know agreed on at the end, then it could be something that becomes a clever move. Um, from what I understand. If the option is in there, it's probably going to be a bit less than some of the numbers that I've seen bound it, um, put out there so far. Um, so yeah, could be could be a clever deal. Um, and for Conte, it's, it's another. He doesn't have to look at that bench and either have no attackers on there or Brian Hill, who we all know is probably hopefully going to be a terrific player. But I think let's be honest, Antonio Conte looks at him and sees. Small child. I think that's essentially what he does. I think he looks at him and goes, who's that small child on the bit? Oh, it's Brian Hill. I think that's... I don't know why I did that voice. That's absolutely not what he sounds like. But I just... I might be wrong. But that's the impression I get. He just looks across and goes, oh, I'm going to put the small child on now. Um, when we know he's so much more than that, Brian Hill. But I think having a player, you know, 26-year-old, plenty of experience. He's a big lad, Dan Juma, as well. Um, he's not going to be kind of knocked around or off the ball. I think just for someone like Conte, that's a bit more comforting <laughs> in a weird way. Um, so, yeah, we shall see. We shall see with Dan Juma. But, um, you know, there's another option. I should point out that uh, I, because I'm working Saturday and Sunday, because I'm going up to press and then I've got to come back on the train the next day, so I'm going to be working through the day, I do actually have tomorrow and Thursday off. So, you know the rule that Spurs seem to announce signings on my days off. I'd be pretty shocked if that didn't happen the next couple of days. But it's Tottenham. Anything can go wrong, you know. I do like the... the I was thinking this earlier as well. Spurs kind of leaping in to sign someone at Everton or about to sign. It's, you know, remember I used the Poundland Chelsea analogy before um, about signing ex-Chelsea managers... Is that the equivalent in transfer terms of Poundland Chelsea? Chelsea going in for these huge expensive targets from other clubs like, um, you know, with Arsenal as well and going in there and grabbing the player. Is this Spurs Poundland version of that? Ooh, Everton are going for him. Quick, quick, quick. I don't know. But, uh, you know, let's hope that it proves to be an astute uh, transfer and we shall see. Um yeah, I've heard varying kind of things about him uh, from people that have seen him and stuff. There's, there's lots of stuff about him being a talented player. Um, be interesting to see how he fits in with the, um, I guess, the aspect of being in, with no disrespect to his former clubs, but I guess a big club where he's got kind of star names that he's got to compete with. I think that's going to be an interesting aspect to, to how he deals with that. Um, I think previously he's been... A bigger fish in a smaller pond is probably the best way to say it. And and now this, you know, going to see how he deals with the adversity and the challenge that lies ahead um, and, and kind of his character and, and how that works with it. So, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Um, but I will come back to Poro later because I want to do a little bit on, on the right wing backs and stuff. So I am going to talk about him. Um, yeah. So, Fulham. Craven Cottage last night, one of my favourite 
grounds. It's so old school, although it's really weird when you're now going in there and sitting in the, the press box seats are like proper wooden. I don't know if the, the fans are exactly the same or not. Actually, I, I really didn't look around me. I should have done. But they're just wooden seats that just are front. Like, honestly, they're probably the original ones that were there back in the day. Um, it's such a quaint, traditional old stadium. I do really, really love it. It's got a brilliant location as well. You walk through the park in the daytime, not so much at night because they lock it. Um, and obviously it's by the river as well. Um, although the new stand looks so, so... It looks fantastic, but it kind of just feels out of place with the rest of the stadium. Um, it's very, very different. And, you know, it's it's quite a big looming thing uh, opposite. But, you know, fair play to them. You do have to modernise, but just in a, in a stadium that's that old school and traditional. It's a bit weird. Um, yeah, and I like their 90s techno Euro dance. Um, so they all there, just before kickoff, all the lights went off. And they were about to do a show, uh, like, a, the light show like a mini light show. And all the crowd went, ooh, <laughs> so that is a really kind of exciting moment. And it was like they were in some kind of rave or nightclub afterwards. Um, it was Free From Desire, the 90s tune. I think it was Gala came out with that. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that was who sang it. But yeah, it was just so funny. And they were properly singing along to it. Yeah, fair, you know, fair play to them. It was a good atmosphere, to be honest. It was a good crowd, good noise. Nobody more noisy than the Tottenham fans, though. The Tottenham fans were incredible. You know, you'll always hear me praise, especially the away fans, um, who are magnificent. But last night, just most of what you could hear, even when the home crowd were at their loudest, you could still hear the Spurs fans. Um, and apparently back home, when you watched it on telly, you could hear them as well. They were, you know, they were so noisy, whether it was from... It, it, they kind of bookended the match with We Want Levy Out chance right at the start and towards the end as well of the game. Uh, that was all kind of going on. Uh, they went through all the normal songs, like chanting Antonio Conte's name. Uh, Harry Kane, of course, when he when he um, equaled the record, he got his you know one of our own chant. He got one season wonder, which was fantastic. I love him that because it's the most sarcastic, fantastic chant there is. But they were just brilliant. They were so brilliant. They they made it feel like a home kind of game at points as well and the team needed that you know I know it's a cliche but they were the 12th man and it's no coincidence that the Conte went over to them the players went over to them at the end um, it's just those moments of connections that are forged again it really was and uh, yeah and what I liked and that kind of fits in nicely with I just feel I, again I could be mistaken but I kind of feel that especially with everything that's gone off the pitch, gone on off the pitch, you know, losing three friends in his life as well, really tragically. I think Conte's been, I don't want to say autopilot, that's not fair, but certainly a lot of the passion and emotion we're used to seeing from him hasn't been there. Um, you know, think back, Thomas Tuchel. <laughs> he was on the sideline, absolutely scrapping with Thomas Tuchel. It looked like that was going to kick off completely, didn't it, at Stamford Bridge. And I just feel like we've seen this, more reflective, downtrodden version of Conte. And what I really liked was, as the game went off on yesterday, I felt like the Spurs players really showed a lot of fight and battle. Um, sorry, a lot of fight as they battled. And I felt like he, in turn, responded to that. And he almost, it almost like recharged him a bit, like a battery. And then at the end, I was watching him going over to the fans, and he was a he was like really snarling and, and punching his fist, both fists at them. And when I was singing his name, he was clapping back. It just felt it did. It felt like someone had hit a reset button on his back, and um, that's that could be huge for Tottenham going forward, because I think we've all been a bit you know downtrodden, downbeat, a bit just beaten and bruised by the thing that is Tottenham Hotspur and the mess that they always seem to constantly be in um, and yeah last night was a big result it wasn't pretty it followed the very familiar pattern of not so great first half coming alive something at the end of the first half and the better second half absolutely followed the blueprints um, as they are pretty much throughout this season um, but do you know what they got the job done and it was a really important win because results everywhere had pretty much gone for them. There were draws all over the place with all the other teams. Um, and 
Had Fulham won, they would have gone ahead of Tottenham, which I think psychologically would have been a big thing. So Spurs had to go there to a team that has been great for, I think they'd won the last, yeah, I think they'd won the previous five matches before that Spurs game. No, sorry, before their, their defeat, the uh, the game before Spurs. Um, so it, it was huge, really, to go there and just come away with the three points. And they did exactly that. And it really gives them, after all of the kind of dismay and despair of those two matches against Arsenal and City, it, they've suddenly got a bit of a platform again to, to build upon because three points now just behind Newcastle and United. Um, so obviously Newcastle third, United fourth. Um, that plays, that, that's, that's just a psychological thing, knowing that you're within a win of catching them. Yes, I think they've both got games in hand, I think. Uh, we've got the table here actually, so I'll be able to tell you. They do both have games in hand, so yes, of course, that uh, plays its part. But it's the old cliche: you'd rather have points on the board than games in hand. So, just to to get that little bit closer to them and feel that you're within striking distance, um, but also looking behind you, there's a five point cushion now to Brighton, who are sixth, and even Brighton. Yes, they've got two games in hand, but it doesn't mean that they're going to make up those five points. Um, and then obviously you look even further down and you've got Chelsea and Liverpool who are seven points behind. Again, they've got, I think they've both got a game in hand. As I've got the table here, might as well look at it. They do, Liverpool got two games in hand. Chelsea have got one. But the way they're playing, again, doesn't mean anything at the moment. Um, it's such a topsy-turvy league right now. So, yeah, I think it was a huge win. I think it was. It was one Guesty and I sat there before the match and were just saying, they have to win this. You know, you don't often, you know, saying the phrase must win can be a bit of a cliche and it's not always really the case. But I really felt it was yesterday because I felt Spurs could have then started to get themselves a little bit disconnected with the top four and they could have found themselves stuck in that like sixth, seventh, eighth spots. Um, and... Do you know, I've said it, I think, in the last video, those fixtures, when you look ahead, get City out of the way and the fixtures really open up for Spurs. They play most of the bottom six. Uh, they've got Chelsea at home, who are obviously Chelsea, we know, are really inconsistent at the moment. So it's there for them to really launch on a bit of run with some momentum um, as the other teams. You know, Newcastle, of course, is still doing fantastically defensively, but the goals have dried up a bit for them as well. Man U, we'll see how they have to, how they react as well to the kind of late defeat at Arsenal. Um, so yeah, there's no guarantee that both of those teams will stay in that top four. Um, so yeah, it was an important win, a really important time. They had to fight, they did. Um, those opening 30, 35, maybe even 40 minutes were very unpleasant, um, I'd imagine, for Spurs. There were a lot of nerves. There was really weird. There were some moments when Spurs passed the ball really well around the press. And I even turned to guess and said, oh, that's some nice football. But there were other occasions when they looked really nervy on the ball and panicky. And funny enough, Christian Romero, who isn't the player to maybe be most panicky in those situations, but he gave the ball away a fair few times um, with some loose touches, loose passes. Yeah, for a guy that's just kind of played in a World Cup final and, and won, um, he looked... He did. He looked inexperienced and nervy at times. And, and obviously Mitrovic is a, is a tough threat as well. Um, but yeah, Harry Kane. <laughs> I was trying to think of other words, but it's Harry Kane. Harry Kane proved to be the difference. You know, was it the 40, was it 44th minute? I'm trying to think when it came now. Um, right at the end of the first half. Just that moment of quality that separates the teams. Um, the second half was a weird one. It was like... It was more even, I'd say, Fulham tried to find a way through, but I wouldn't say either team particularly found a lot of time to test the goalkeeper. I saw a lot of chances to create, the, a lot of chances to test the goalkeepers. I can speak, I promise I can. Um, the only one I can really think of is Harry Kane having that, Ben Davies did a lovely cross, uh, sorry, a lovely header across the goal, and... Um, Harry Kane headed it kind of straight at Leno. I mean, it was a reaction save. It was sort of a decent save. But in terms of where Kane would normally put that, I think he would normally bury that. Um, and that obviously would have completely killed the game off. But 
other than that, I can't really remember too many big chances at either end. Um, Spurs never really looked from half-time onwards particularly like they were in danger. And that's testament to the defending. And also, Lloris, you know, Lloris didn't have too much to do over the game. And I think that is testament to the back line and the way they fought. Um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about it, but Spurs had quite an important meeting between Conte, the staff, and the players on Saturday at Hotspur Way. Um, we're going to go into that in a little bit more detail um, a bit later on, but um, you could tell that he hopes that this was the turning point for, for all of that and that meeting included. I asked him, you know, did you get what you wanted? You asked him for fight. Did you get what you wanted um, from this match? And he said... Yeah, good answer. Good answer from my players. After two defeats to Arsenal and Man City, don't forget we're talking about first and second in the table. I asked my players to show me some characteristics I saw last season. The desire, the will to help each other on the pitch and to suffer in the moments in the game you have to suffer. Today, we didn't suffer a lot, but I've seen that they were ready to and that they're ready. So it has to be a starting point for us. Don't forget we played against a team who, in my opinion, are a real surprise this season. With a win, they could overcome us in the table. To win away here is not easy. So for this reason, I'm really happy. Really happy because, I repeat, I saw again the characteristics that brought us last season a place in the Champions League. And like I say, the other reason it was important as well was because it came in such a rubbish week for Spurs. Honestly, it's been a difficult week um, with everything else. But you've also had the Fabio Paratici stuff. Um, my mind has just gone back to the last video I did late at night while waiting for a comment that never came from Tottenham and still hasn't come um, from Tottenham. If you if you missed everything, um, Fabio Paratici has been banned for 30 months by the Italian Football Federation um, for what they saw as his part in, let's say, financial irregularities at Juventus. Technically, the accusation was fixing the balance sheets by artificial gains. Um, and it's a ban that the Italian Football Federation have asked FIFA and UEFA to extend globally. Um, and I had a little bit more of a look into it the day after I did the video. And it looks like he would also now fail the Premier League's um, fit and proper test for owners and directors. And obviously his title is Managing Director of Football. It's quite interesting. He's not listed if you go into company's house among their directors, yet in the Premier League handbook uh, of directors of the club, he is listed among the directors. So I don't know which way that works. and, and uh, it, It's all a bit of a jumble. But what I felt, found quite interesting um, at the match at Craven Cottage was I'm used to looking down or looking across and seeing Pratici. He normally sits about two rows behind the dugout among the subs and, and staff and stuff and he's he's a bit of a madman during the match he is a bundle of energy constantly shouting and screaming at decisions um honestly he goes mad during the game and you see him chewing the ear off of someone it used to be Galini last season it's been Romero occasions this season I've seen him just whoever's next to him essentially the the kind of is unfortunate almost enough to have their ear chewed off by his constant uh rantings during games but at Craven Cottage, it's the first time I've seen it, he was up in the director's box. He was very sedately sitting there. Um, he was up with the board. And, yeah, I do wonder exactly what that means, whether it's a kind of a hint or a pointer towards the future, um, a taste of the little disconnect that's now going to be in, in place, you know, because Spurs are bracing themselves for the potential you know, wider ban, um, and obviously what that means. <sighs> you know, they're obviously Juventus have already announced that they will appeal um, the process. <sighs> it's still such a difficult one. I said it in the last video. It's almost like it's difficult for Spurs just through association with Paratici. You know, he's been picked out as the main man in this kind of thing. He's the one that's got the biggest ban from the Italian Federation. And it's not the only investigation going on. UEFA are doing their own investigation as well. Obviously, part of this, I think it was called PRISM, uh, P-R-I-S-M, um, investigation that went on into everything that took place. So I do wonder where it's taken. Is It doesn't look good. You know, Spurs are yet to comment on it at this stage. Um, we were told in no uncertain terms that 
Conte would not answer any questions about it in the press conference after the game. Um, we were told this before the presser. Um, and obviously he worked with Pratici at Juve as well. And so what all this means, you know, from what I understand, Pratici is the main man that Conte goes through when he when he wants to talk to, to the board. You know, he does speak to Levy at times and stuff like that, but mainly everything goes through Pratici. Um, so, yeah, what comes next is going to be very, very interesting. Um <sighs> I can't see, unless there's an amazing U-turn, how it ends in a good way for Spurs and Pratici at this point in time. You know, the appeal process may turn things around, but, you know, like I said, there's other investigations still to come. I do, I think it's just going to be difficult for him to continue doing the job. Um, but we'll find out, you know. We'll find out what the next few weeks brings. But like I say, Spurs bracing themselves for the possibility that he's not going to be able to operate anywhere. Because currently it's just within the auspices of the Italian Football Federation. But if it becomes across Europe and globally, his job suddenly becomes, I was going to say, impossible to do. I mean, technically, I suppose you could... I don't even know. I don't even know what's there's left for him to be able to do. I just can't see how that works. So, yeah. We'll see what the next couple of weeks brings. I'd imagine, you know, he was working. Um, he was certainly working the day after. Um, because I know some agents that he was in contact with the day, when was it? Friday night. I knew on Saturday that he'd spoken to. Um, so, yeah. So, yeah, we'll see. Maybe it's a case of getting towards the end of the tra getting to the end of the transfer window. And then um, all sides look at what happens next and whether it can still be a working relationship, I guess. Um, I'm very intrigued to see whether we get our transfer window roundup. That could be an awkward one. Um, who else does it? Does Daniel Levy talk about the window? My goodness, Daniel Levy communicate? Ooh. Um, I don't know. I don't know what's going to what's going to happen. But it has. It's just been a messy week. You've had the Pratchett stuff. You've had Conte and Kane's future both played out in the media as well. Um, there was a Hotspur way on Saturday morning. There was about, I, I couldn't really tell, only from looking at the videos, maybe 30, 40, 50, a push. Um, small, a small crowd, but passionate fans out there, outside Hotspur way, uh, letting their feelings be known about Daniel Levy, about Enoch, the owners, um, you know, just, just making themselves heard. So, obviously, you know, that's something that will have been seen and noted. Um, and I just think in a week where everything's kind of had been bad news, it felt like Conte and the team almost just created a bubble around themselves. I remember Poch saying something similar um, at some point in his reign. that he, he, he always, his idea was to create this bubble around the team to keep out the outside world. And it almost feels like that's what Spurs did. They put all of that rubbish, not rubbish, but all of that noise, I guess is the best way, around them. Um, and, and just just pushed it out and put this little barrier in between them. And they, they did well. They did well. You know, it's not a performance you're going to write home about and say, oh, the sexy football that Tottenham played. But it was a, a performance that showed that they're fighting for Conte and they're fighting for Spurs. And I think that was important. Really, really important. Um, but there's one man for me. Who's just that bit more important than anyone else? Look, you know, there's no man that should really be bigger than one club. Uh, or, of course. But my goodness, Harry Kane comes close. He is so crucial to Tottenham. And Spurs have been so fortunate to have him for so many years. Um, and Monday night just brought another example. Honestly, when I see on social media, and I know it's not the best barometer for any form of sense or logic, but when I see people saying that he should be sold, oh, honestly, my brain cannot process that thought. It makes no logical sense to me for a number of reasons. Um, he's just the difference for Tottenham on so many occasions. I often wonder, you know, when you see a team like Fulham playing really nice football last night, when you see a team like Brighton passing the ball around, I must admit, I always wonder, rather than think of, oh, what would what would Kane be like at Man City or United or Chelsea or whatever, 
I don't think that. I actually think, what would Brighton be like if you had Harry Kane up front? I think they'd be incredible. I really do. I think you'd have wonderful football to watch, possession football, and you'd have a world-class striker at the very tip of it all, scoring goals galore. That's always... Maybe I'm just a bit weird. I think I am a bit weird. But that's where my brain always goes. I just think, oh, you imagine if that team had Kane up front. That's why I always look at it. They'd be such a great team to kind of support and watch on a, a weekly basis. Um, he's just got this ability as well to suddenly turn a game in an instant. If things aren't quite going right, he just has that ability to pick up the ball, just surge forward past a couple of players with it, and either pick out a wonderful crossfield ball, through ball, whatever, or a curl of beauty into the corner. And Monday night brought us the latter. It did. Um, it was entirely fitting, I felt, that his 266th goal, that's an incredible total, his 266th goal for me was just classic Kane. It was a trademark Kane goal. Uh, Hoybier passing the ball to Son, Sonny playing a quick little pass into Kane's feet, Kane turning, drifting inside a bit and just curling a beauty inside the right-hand post. Leno just, he didn't even move, he's just like, ah. Oh. She's like, oh, pants. I just could see him just, just look at it and go, yeah, no chance. It was inch perfect. It was so good. Um, some other little stats for you, as well as that being his 266th goal, 66th goal for Tottenham, and equaling, of course, the late, great Jimmy Greaves. It was his 300th Premier League appearance. He's now on 199 Premier League goals, so he's about to become only the third player to break the 200-goal mark uh, behind Rooney and Shearer. Um, 16 goals in 21 Premier League games this season, which is a terrific total. If it wasn't for Erling Haaland being a bit of a machine coming into the league, I think a lot more people would be speaking about Harry Kane in front of goal this season, just absolutely smashing it again. Um, and as I said before, I still don't even think Harry Kane has been playing his best form this season. Um, if he can really ramp it up and, and kind of get to where we know he can be, He's going to be scoring a lot of goals. He really is. Um, and do you know what was even more impressive than all of it? Not only is he a man that comes up with the goods when you need him to on most occasions, he did so on Monday night, having had a fever and the worst night's sleep. He would said he's up every couple of hours with like a bug or a virus. Um, but it shows how important he is and how, how important he knows he has to be for Tottenham that when he was asked if he could play, he was there without any hesitation uh, to still play. And you could hear some of his interviews afterwards, he sounded a little bit kind of almost like bunged up and, yeah, fair play to him. And, and Conte afterwards, honestly, he was just absolutely lavishing praise on him. He said, today he was amazing. I think he scored a fantastic goal, the execution to control the ball, then to kick it in that way. Only a world-class striker can score this type of goal. About the spirit that I spoke about before, I want to underline Harry today played with a fever. And he was not so good, but he wanted to play because he understood the moment. He understood that he's a point of reference for us, for me, for the other players. I think with Hugo, they are the two players who are a point of reference for the dressing room. Today, I'm really happy because I think he was rewarded with a goal. So technically... Conte is saying that he played with a fever game, which is just, I mean, you probably now find that just, there's going to be a massive virus that's going to go through the Spurs squad, but fair play. God, when I have a virus, that like man flu -y type stuff, I'm absolutely knocked out and whinging at everyone that will hear it. I don't think I could play an entire 90 minutes of football um, in the Premier League, and well, I couldn't do that without a fever, and um, scored a winning goal to boot as well. What else did he say? He said more about it. Kane, he said, we're talking about a player that has fantastic ability and skills. For sure, I would. For sure, I would like. I would absolutely. For sure, I'd like to help him and me also and his teammates to try to do something important to win something with Tottenham because he loves Tottenham. Tottenham is in his heart, and it should be good if together we're able to win something. But then it's important to have this record. But I think it could be more important if you're good to lift a trophy. Um. Yeah, it's, uh, he does, <sighs> you know. I said it earlier, no man is bigger than a football club, but just the thought for me for life at Tottenham without Harry Kane is so bleak. It really is. 
you know, I said earlier the fans were singing he's a one season wonder. Um, it, that's I know it's a sarcastic, ironic chant, uh, but it says it all. You know, you can talk about players that maybe have had a little brief impact, impact on a on a club and Spurs. You know, we 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 kind of remember longingly some of those players that maybe only at Spurs for a year or two, three at the most. And you look at someone like Harry Kane. I, I, I had to look this up because I'd forgotten how long ago it was. He made his Spurs debut 11 and a half years ago. Obviously, he started playing regularly from 2014, but ever since then, the goals have just rained down. This is a player who has just given everything to Tottenham. Um, and I just think to see him in any club's other club's shirt would be probably the most traumatic experience for most Spurs fans. It would be horrible to see. It really would. Um, and, and I think also from the club's point of view, I said this before when he was linked with City, um, what was it, over a year ago, 18 months now, um, you'd have to spend huge money on two players to replace him. One, like an attacking midfielder creator type, and one a finisher. He is both in one. Um, and there's no guarantee that they would re replicate the same output that he produces either. So honestly, oh, it would be. Oh, I just thought of him. It, it's just ridiculous. I suppose honestly, without him, and it, and it really that's why when people say, um, you know, that he could potentially, you know, I'll oh, just sell him. You know, he, he's had his best years and all this. It's like, no, no, and you know, the good thing about Harry Kane is that for Spurs fans is that his primary objective in his career is to try to win trophies with Tottenham Hotspur. That's it. He wants to win silverware, but his utmost objective is to do so with Tottenham Hotspur. Um, it's never changed. That's always been his stance, to be fair to him. He's never deviated from that whatsoever. You probably have seen, myself and others reported um, ahead of the game, that, you know, that objective remains clear. And although there's no rush to resolve his future, because he does still have 18 months left on his deal, um... You know, everyone that I've spoken to around him or that knows him says that he's very uh, very focused on the now at the moment and trying to get Spurs into the top four, you know, try and hopefully win an FA Cup and also progress in the Champions League as well. But everyone I've spoken to has said the same thing, that he would be open to discussing the right contract uh, with Tottenham if the club do open talks as expected, you know, in the in the weeks um, after the transfer window closes. So that's exactly what the Spurs fans want to hear. And I also think it's actually quite clever manoeuvring and positioning from his camp. I think it's quite clever in that regard as well, because it piles the pressure on Levy and the club. It absolutely does. It's, you know, it's pretty much saying, OK, yeah, yeah, no, you know, um, Harry will sign a deal if... The deal is right and he senses, you know, that the club is progressing and showing the ambition that he wants to show. It's very much, you know, I think it it takes away if the worst case scenario were to happen and he were to eventually leave the club. I think having been very clear that he was willing to stay if the club were, you know, going to match his ambition, then I don't think you can forgive him if he were to go because clearly... He wouldn't be staying because he didn't feel that that was the case. And I think a lot of the finger would be pointed at Levy and the owners. And of course it would. Um, so, yeah, I do think it's quite clever to just maintain this stance. I, th I think it does. I think it throws the ball firmly or hits the ball um, firmly into Levy and Enix court. It absolutely does. He's their star man and he's saying, I want to win trophies with this club. Are you going to make it happen? And I think that's spot on, really. Um, you know, you can't accuse Harry Kane of not giving his all for Tottenham. He has, absolutely has, um, and and he spoke about it. Um, Guesty Dan Kirkpatrick from the Sound and Tom Barkley, I think it was, uh, was got him in the mix zone after the game after he'd scored, uh, and he said 
Well, they asked about his future. He said, of course, I still want to win trophies for Tottenham Hotspur. That's been my goal since I started playing first team football with them. It hasn't happened. I've been open about how I feel about that, but I'll continue to try to achieve that. We have a really good squad, a fantastic manager, and there's no reason why we still can't be successful this season. We've just got to put everything we can into it and see where we are come May or June. And when he was asked further about the contract talk and whether there's been any, um, he said, there's not, there's not been much talk, if I'm totally honest. I'm sure there'll be conversations over the coming months, but to be honest, I'm just focused on this season and doing my best for the team. There's still a lot to play for, trying to get in the Champions League. We have the FA Cup and the Champions League still to try to win. My focus is on that. I know there's going to be rumours, a lot of talk and speculation about my future, but I'm just focused on what I can do. Um, and I think one of the important things as well is he always has quite a good bond, with, a strong bond with every manager. I think they realise how important he is. So he had a terrific one with Poch, a very good one with Mourinho, Nuno... Obviously, they had a difficult start because Kane clearly wanted to leave <laughs> at that point, um, and he wasn't around for long. But you can definitely see with Conte, there's a very Conte respects him hugely, and there's been some talk that perhaps you know their futures are intertwined. I think logically that does make a bit of sense. I do think Spurs getting in the top four and being in Champions League again next season would be another aspect. Um, but yeah, he was asked whether his and Conte's futures were intertwined, um, and he said. Uh, I'm not going to talk about the manager's future. That's down to him. I'm sure he'll have conversations with the club and assess where we are as a team. He's had a lot going on, on and off the pitch, so he probably needs time to assess it all. From my point of view, I really enjoy working with him, and it would be fantastic if he did stay. So that, bear in mind we're talking about the end of the season, it would be fantastic if he did stay. That doesn't sound like someone that isn't thinking about next season. Okay, So that, that's, that's just maybe me reading too much into it, but I thought that was quite good. Um, and he was also asked about Conte having this you know, horrible season off the pitch with, with losing friends. And he said, it's always tough because the manager is the leader and the boss, the one that everyone looks up to. Of course, we know he's been going through a tough time outside of football and it's not been helped by some of the results we've had on the pitch either. As players, we take responsibility for that. It's about digging deep and sticking together. Through tough times, you find out who you really are. And the last couple of weeks have been difficult. But we bounce back with a good win. And we're going to need more of that if we're going to be where we want to be at the end of the season. So, yeah. Look, for me, it's one of the biggest crimes in football. As in on-pitch crimes. That sounds weird. Especially as there has been actual crimes in football. But it's one of the um, loose use of the word crimes. Biggest crimes in football that a player like Harry Kane, absolutely world-class, has no trophies to its name. You know, the Audi Cup doesn't count, I'm sorry. Or the Peace Cup, was it as well? They don't count. Um, and his individual trophies are fantastic for his uh, scoring achievements and playmaker award. But it's absolutely criminal that he does not have a proper team trophy to his name. It really, really is. Um, like I say, he's given his career to Tottenham Hotspur. Um, it's about time they gave him something back. I really do believe that. Um, what else was I going to say about the game? The defence. We could talk about a little bit about the defence. Um, they needed that clean sheet big time. Conte constantly says, it, and he's right, it's not just about the defence, it's about the rest of the team. They all attack together, they all defend together. But boy, was that a big clean sheet for Hugo Lloris and the defenders, I think. Just for confidence reasons. You know, Hugo Lloris, of course, under fire. Um, but I thought he, he looked pretty confident most of what he did. There was It was one moment. When someone, I think it was Romero, headed the ball in front of him and, and Lloris was, was flying behind him to do something, I don't know what. That was the only moment I looked and I thought, oh, you know, why were you flying out at that point when Romero clearly was going to head it away? And I think there was one moment where, to be fair, it was quite a powerful shot and it kind of rebounded off him and he gathered it at the second attempt. But other than that, I felt he did everything asked of him. And to be fair, the defence in front of him shielded him from a much uh, from most of the stuff that he would have had to face um, like I say Romero a little bit iffy in the first half but I felt he grew as the game wore on I thought Dyer and Davies had pretty good games I do wonder whether facing Mitrovic and that real physical threat is probably I might be being harsh but maybe is more of a comfortable thing for them to deal with than let's say the City and an Arsenal ridiculously fast skillful talented dribbler types that they've had to deal with um, in recent days but no I thought they did well I thought the back line were all pretty solid 
Wing backs were a bit mixed. I thought Parasic had another night where he didn't really impact it for me. And obviously with Sonny still not firing on all cylinders yet, um, that left-hand side, not too much went down that side. Although you could argue the goal kind of came from that. Sonny obviously did grab an assist um, for that. There was obviously a moment with him as well. I can't remember who he went in for a tackle in. Um, caught the guy quite high up his ankle. Um, Marco Silva, Fulham boss, felt that it should have been more than a yellow. Um, that's a really awkward one for me. I think slowed down, it looked worse. Um, I do wonder, there was some in the press box that said it was quite lucky to not have more uh, dished out to him. But I don't know, I kind of felt it was one of those where he's, he's driven, he had about four or five players around him and he's kind of twisting, turning and trying to reach for the ball. It certainly wasn't intentional. Um, I think a red would have just been a bit harsh for me. It was one of those that's maybe you look at it, it's, it's like an orange. It's between yellow and a red. Um, but yeah, yeah, we still need to see Sonny kind of spark back to life. Hasn't happened yet. This was his first assist since October, early October as well. So, you know, we need more of those. That would be great. Um, on the other side... Kulusevski, I didn't think he was on his top, top form, but he was still probably the most kind of penetrative player um, in terms of getting down the right-hand side, getting into the box and trying to set up stuff. Um, and Emerson Royale behind him had a very good game. I laugh because every time you think Emerson's heading towards the exit door, it kind of grabs onto it and pulls himself back in. Um... I wasn't going to do the Pacino impression there. But um, I thought he played well. I thought he had a very good game. He did. I actually, my ratings went out and I'd forgotten to update his score. He was heading towards a six for me. And right near the end of the game, I decided he was going to go up to a seven, especially because he did an interception at the end, which was really good in his own box. It was perfectly timed, really crucial moment. And I was going to bump him up to a seven. And I looked, I published it. I was like, ah, oh, give him a six. That's absolutely not what he deserved. And, you know, some people are saying... Possibly was up to an 8. and I, I, If I could give him a 7.5, that's probably what I would give him, but we're not allowed half marks in our ratings. Um, you know, I thought he did well. He forced Leno into a save first half as well. So he kind of did what Conte wanted, uh, getting up there as like another attacker. And he's really found himself back in the reckoning. Obviously, Matt Doherty had this illness um, ahead of the Arsenal game. And it's allowed Emerson, it shows how tight that race has been for the, the shirt that literally you miss one game and the other guy comes in and gets a couple of back-to-back -back starts instead of it. And he's got such a great engine, Emerson. He's so super fit. He gets up and down the flank. Um, he just loves life at Tottenham Hotspur. He really does. There was like one moment that was utterly unnecessary. He did like a little back heel. I think it was to Kulisevsky. It was so unnecessary. And Spurs fans were like, way. <laughs> and you just know that on his social media channels, um, he'll have he'll have put like that little back flick. That's it. That that'll have been the thing that have gone on it. It's so funny. He just enjoys himself. Look, he's not the most talented player in the world. He's not the greatest right wing back there will ever be. I still do think he can be a good right back. But my goodness, he he gives everything he's got and he enjoys himself. Um, and that's not meant to sound patronising. It is honestly. It's genuinely impressive because football can be a game that can beat you down. It really can, especially if you're not playing every game. Uh, but he just doesn't seem to lose his positivity. I've said it before, he's a terrific character in the dressing room. He's a really driven guy. Um, and I think he's created this fascinating scenario now in the transfer window of, look, they want Pedro Porro. They do. Um, as I said earlier in the video um, about the little bit that got chopped out by the um, the aggregators. The Pedro Porro deal is still very much one that could go either way right now. Spurs want him. The player, I understand, is keen to come to Tottenham. Obviously, you're not going to go to all this effort if he wasn't. Um, and I think the progress that is there is this, this feeling now that Sporting has started to come away from this very much release clause or nothing. And as I said before, it's 39.5 million release clause. And the thing with a release clause, obviously, is that you have to pay it all up front of course there's ways the back end that you can manage that you can get loans your end i guess and pay that over installments and everything but 
in terms of the actual deal with the club, it's it's an all or nothing thing. Um, so the fact that it looks like Sporting are starting to compromise on that is a big thing, and it maybe means that they could get this done. But like I say, it could go either way at the moment, which, if we take that in isolation, is not news. Um, but yeah, my the Emerson, why I say the Emerson part of it is interesting, because I can't see Spurs paying the wages of three senior right wing-backs when... All three are not going to play at all, uh, unless there's some really bad injuries. But, you know, yeah, because also, you've also, it's difficult for Conte, because you've got, you're going to have at least one or two unhappy members of the squad in those positions, which uh, is it's, it's a really difficult task for a manager. That's why most managers don't like a bloated squad, which is why Chelsea's going to be an absolute nightmare for Potter. Um but also, like I say, convincing uh, a regularly playing and very happy Emerson that he needs to move on when he's loving life in London. Uh, I think he lives with friends as well. I think, he's, I think his girlfriend as well. He's having a time of his life. Why would he want to give that up, you know? And that, you know, you could say, yes, this recent display maybe is a shop window one as well. It puts him out there and those interested parties from Italy and Spain maybe look at that and go, OK, yeah, no, definitely we can see that there's a player there we want. Um, but yeah, do you get him out the door? <laughs> it's, it's a really awkward situation. And there is a part of me that's starting to wonder, like, because Matt Doherty has stated quite clearly he didn't want to leave Spurs this season. Um, Spurs, there didn't seem to be much interest in letting him go this January. But I do wonder in this final week, if we get to a point where Porro does become more likely than not, and Emerson isn't going to leave, do Spurs and Conte start to think, maybe maybe we say to Matt Doherty, you're not going to play. It's up to you. Do you want to go out? But you're not going to play much football. Um, and Doherty then may decide. Obviously, they're not going to get the kind of fee they get for Doherty that they would for Emerson. Emerson being, what, 24. Doherty now in his 30s. It's, you know, it's not the same kind of thing. Um, but I just can't see how they have three senior right wing backs at the club at the same time. It would just be, it would be chaos to be honest, in a financial sense and also in a, in a player sense. I mean, it could work their way in terms of someone could get injured in the first week, but it's not really the way you'd normally do it. Um, but yeah, Porro's an interesting one because, I think I said this before, he um, he makes sense for Tottenham if, you know, we're looking at it that... I said last week, last um, in the last video, it's about the now for Tottenham and Conte. Just concentrate on the now. We'll cross the whole bridge of Conte next season when it comes to it. At the moment, unless there's a huge bust-up between Conte and Levy, um, or the results just go for an absolute nosedive during this good period of fixtures, I can't see a scenario where Conte isn't with Spurs until the end of the season. And I think that feels like that's the club's view as well. We'll cross the bridge of the summer and next season when we come to it. Exactly what we did last season. It's a recurring theme, but we'll cross it then. Because um, it's a very different scenario to last season. You know, he had a contract for this season. Whereas, whether Spurs want to, at that point, extend the contract, take up the option so he can leave for nothing. It could be a mutual... Who knows? As I say, it's that's something for later. But what you've got to do now is you've got to build for now still... But you've also got to have one little eye on the future just in case there isn't a Conte future beyond the summer. And I think Porro's quite, you know, impressive. It's impressive. is quite fitting because I think he's a bit of both. He's a player for the now. You know, he's got two seasons worth of Champions League experience, played over 100 games across La Liga and the Portuguese top flight as well. Um, yeah, he is. He's an experienced guy. He really is. And, like I said, that Champions League experience is massive as well. Again, if he comes in, we have another scenario, don't we, where the Champions League squad then goes up to 19 players. So you would really have to lose two. Um, I am starting to think in my head whether that... I know potentially it could only be two games. But I do wonder whether that now becomes more and more of a thing when there's two players there looking to sign are going to be foreign players. Uh, you know, maybe more. Depends what opportunities come up in the final week. But, um, yeah, Porro is someone that the club have liked and scouted extensively before Conte's arrival. 
means that he's more likely to be a player that works in a, let's say if there was a post-Conte era, he works better in it. Um, what I am intrigued by is Spurs are understood to have offered players at various points as well as part of discussions to Sporting as well. So that makes sense for me if it's if it's a right wing back. If it were to be Emerson, let's say, that would make sense because you're doing like for like. You're not adversely affecting your squad. I think you could maybe get away with someone like Jaffet Tenganga as a younger defender. I think you could maybe get away with not having him in the squad for the remainder of the, the half of the second half of the season. Still could leave you a bit of a mess if there were injuries, but it's maybe, I'd say, let's say Davinson Sanchez. If Davinson Sanchez went, um, I'd say he's more problematic because of his experience in the Champions League and the Premier League. I think you'd have to replace him in the last week of the window, which, like I say, don't want to repeat it, but I kind of have to the plan was in the summer was to get two centre-backs, a left side and one on one who could play either right or in the centre. So would, you'd have to push up one of those plans or do another long lay, uh, De Juma, in terms of uh, Dan Juma, of bringing in a, a lone player just for a certain amount of time. Because that is the other aspect to the not knowing about Conte, is that's probably why you have like the long lay deal and why you've got this Dan Juma deal as well, that you know they are initially... Well, with with um, long there there is no option to buy. So, yeah, it's it's having players that if they don't work for the next manager, they don't have to stick around. It's it's not going to cost you anything. So, yeah, I am intrigued to see you go. I mean, obviously, there's someone like Brian Hill is another one. You know, when I now the more you think about the foreign player side of it with the Champions League. Maybe Brian Hill, despite Christian Stellini, I asked Christian Stellini in the press conference. Will Brian Hill stay for the, Brian Hill stay for the second half of the season? And he says yes, yes, he will. But I do wonder now with the foreign player thing. Yes, it could only be two games, but you hope it'd be more. And the fact that Brian Hill wants to play regular football and maybe now finds himself below Dan Juma in the pecking order. Although Dan Juma is is obviously is is left hand side compared to um, Hill on the right. Yeah, it's does. You know, does he see that that maybe pushes Richarlison as another right-sided one? Does Brian Hill then suddenly become, you know, right down that list? So if Brian Hill were to leave, I still think you'd need to replace him as well because of the Lucas Moura situation. Lucas Moura with his inflamed tendon issue, which, you know, shows no sign of really getting anywhere at the moment. You know, you just fingers crossed. You never know. It, suddenly one day he might have a breakthrough. And that seems to be what it is. Some days he's good. Some days he's bad. Um, and obviously we now have the contract situation where his contract, Spurs didn't take the option, that expired at the end of December, and he's heading towards the end of his time at Spurs, it would seem. So I do think you go in a situation where maybe you have to then bring in another attacker in the final week. Um, but flip side, Brian Hill needs minutes, and there's this Champions League thing as well, the numbers the more and more it gets in my head, the more and more I think that I think they are going to have to let Brian Hill go out on loan. We'll see. We'll see. And of course, there's Jed Spence. We're forgetting about him as well. Um, that, you know, oh, it's just a ridiculous situation, let's be honest, that he was have, he is having to head off six months into uh, having uh, six months after having joined. But Brian Hill, I guess, was exactly the same in his first season. Um, like I say, Bayer Leverkusen, Southampton, West Ham, Palace. I think there's a few other Premier League clubs also sniffing around him now as well. Um, yeah, I think we're at the stage now. He just has to go out and loan. I don't even think there should be a question about it now. I think he, he has to go out there, get minutes, help his development, and then come back in the summer to whoever the manager may be, a more complete and developed player, I think. I think it's essential for him, really. Um so yeah, lots of questions that Levy and Prakicci need to answer really in the week ahead. Who goes, who stays, and how it all shapes up. Um, yeah, the more I think about it, honestly. I've kind of convinced myself over the course of this video thus far that I think Brian Hill is going to end up having to go out on loan. I think so. Um, and then what knock-on effect that has. You could end up just leave Unless they get some good news on Lucas, they're just going to end up leaving themselves short again. It's Tottenham, so you can never rule out anything.
Um, but yeah, I just wanted to talk also about that meeting at Hotspur Way um, between the players and Conte. Sometimes I think when things aren't going your way, you just need to sit down, air some views and opinions and thrash things out. And it feels like that's what's happened this week and they've come out the other side better for it. Um, sounds like Conte showed them all the stats, the indisputable figures that they can't um, deny or get away from. Um, and certainly the players were allowed to kind of stand up and, and make or sit down. I don't know whether they stood up or sit down, but they were allowed to really kind of have their say on what they believe has taken place this season and why it hasn't really felt the same as last season, why the performances have been different and the results have been different as well. Um, Conte spoke to us a little bit about the meeting last night. He said, I wasn't angry. This has to be very clear. In these situations, sometimes you're a bit upset, but I wasn't angry. I showed only the stats. And when there is the stats, it's the truth. When it says 21 goals in the last 10 games, you have to accept and to understand that maybe we can do much more. But together, and me also, maybe I didn't work on some aspects. And for this reason, when I have a good relationship with the players and I tell them always the truth, they know that if I, if I want to, they accept it because they're really good players and smart people. Then today, at Fulham, they tried to give me an answer and today they gave me an answer very well. But this has to not be the only game. Despite it being a difficult game today against Fulham, for this reason, now my expectation is to build on this win for the rest of the season to be competitive and to make our fans proud of our team. At least he didn't say, we're going to make you proud. Um, and Conza, that was an interesting thing as well. He also admitted that some of his close friends, he's been asking them for their views on Spurs and what's gone, what's different to last season. He said, last season it was the spirit. And also many of my friends tell me, or people I ask to watch the game and I tell them to tell me their consideration... Many people tell me the team compared to last season is not so solid. The will, the desire to defend, to get three points despite the difficulty is not the same as last season. Because also my feeling is this, but I repeat, when you concede 21 goals in 10 games, it means there is something wrong and can not only be a tactical aspect. For this reason, I think we work. We worked about the mentality and in the mind, in the heart, and in this desire to sacrifice for the team to help each other. I think that it has to be a starting point, this, but we'll see quickly. On Saturday, we have a tough game away, and we have to be ready to show also that we learned about those two defeats against Arsenal and Manchester City. And actually, Kane, uh, the guys asked him in the mix zone while this presser was going on about this uh, the meeting. Um, and he said, we have meetings every week anyway, but it was more just talking amongst all of us and voicing our opinions on getting back to keeping clean sheets, being strong, compact fighting digging deep if a fixture is like last night was or this this match was there's going to be times when one nil is enough i think especially coming off the back of being two nil up against city and not being able to see that through when we look back at what we've been at when we've been at our best last year and this year it's when we've been compact and hard to break down it was nice to come back and do that um like i said conte will have looked at the fixture schedule he'll know that there's this good run coming up that Tottenham really on paper should be picking up a lot of points from and it reminded me when he started to speak at the end of his press conference it reminded me a little bit there was a point last season it was it was a bit later it was about March it was across the games that they beat Everton 5-0 and then they went to Man U and although they lost 3-2 they played really well it was a really good performance and pretty much Ronaldo just kind of undid them and there was a point then when Conte he just seemed to level up his ambitions. And he said, I've challenged them to get in the top four. That's our challenge now. And it went from the whole season, him talking about, you know, we just want to be up there and compete and be in and around it and maybe have a chance to be in the top four. And it switched to, we're going to now aim for the top four. And you could just see Spurs kicked on from that point as well. The win-loss, win-loss thing stopped and they moved into far more consistent performances. And I just felt at Craven Cottage, the way he spoke, it wasn't quite as going as far to say that yet, but it did feel that he's starting to level up a little bit. And I kind of got a sense, this is just me assuming, but I got a sense in this meeting perhaps that people would have said, let's stop talking about being realistic and, and kind of doing down the club, knowing the level of the club. Let's aim, let's be ambitious, let's go for it. If we're not going to have the belief that we can do it, then kind of almost what's the point? And I do think his quotes were quite interesting, maybe tied in with that. He said, I think we have to be dreamers. I spoke to the players and I said today has to be the starting point for us. Many times, many times, especially after defeat, you can learn much more than from a win. 
After the game against Manchester City and also especially the game against Arsenal, it was important to make a good reflection with our players and to understand maybe something we lost. We lost something compared to last season. Not offensively, because last season we were one of the best, and today, this season, we are third in attack in the league. But we lost something defensively. I repeat when I say defensively, I want to involve the whole team. For this reason, I spoke with the players to find again their resilience, to show again their desire and their will to defend the result. Yeah, I have intelligent players, smart players and good men. Today they gave me a good answer, but I repeat, it has to be the starting point. On Saturday, we have an important game and we want to go to the next round. The FA Cup away against a championship team is not easy. If we want to be the dreamers, we have to know this is an important game for us because the FA Cup is a cup game. Then we have also Champions League, 17 games to go in the Premier League, and it's up to us. If I see this desire again, this commitment, this unity and the will to help each other, I think that we have time to have another good season. And to be fair, Kane was pretty much echoed these thoughts and what he kind of wants from he wants Spurs to really have a go this second half of the season. He said, that's the way we've got to look at it. This is Kane. There's still a lot of games to play in the Premier League. We have an important FA Cup game at the weekend and the Champions League starts again in February. In football, things can turn around really quickly and all of a sudden you can be right in amongst two competitions and fighting for Champions League spots. And when we looked at where we were last year, managed to get in Champions League, anything's possible still. Nights like tonight at Fulham and def will definitely help, but it's about how we're building this now and that starts with the FA Cup this weekend. And this is my feeling about it. Despite all of the recent kind of grumbles that we've all had of frustrations and anger and things, there's still a big chance for Tottenham this season to actually do something. Um, it's kind of there for them to make of it what they want. Obviously, they need to improve the squad in the transfer market. They need to improve the performances on the pitch as well. But if they do both, there's really no reason why they can't give all of the frustrated fans and frustrated reporters uh, something to really kind of shout about and, and in Conte's word, be proud of again. Um, so, yeah, first stop is the FA Cup. Uh, we've got Christian Stellini in the press conference, which I know technically doesn't make it sound like Conte is treating it as that important a game. I think he just wants time off from a press conference, to be honest with you. Um because he knows he's going to be asked about his future. And the, the pre-match ones are always bigger, longer press conferences. So he probably knows it's going to come up against again. Um, and some journo that you know may try to slip in a Paratici question as well, which is going to have to be batted away. So we have St uh, Stellini. And St Christian Stellini, he's really interesting. He is a good person to have in a press conference. He's more to the point and quick and um, economical with his answers than Conte. But he gives you good stuff. I'm probably going to ask him something training tactical based with some of the players because I've asked him about that before. He really, you give him a question in his wheelhouse and he's really happy to kind of talk about it. I spoke about Saar last time and he spoke about all the things that they're working with him on training to improve and it was really fascinating. So I might go somewhere along that line. Um, so yeah, FA Cup this weekend. I'm still waiting to find out actually what I've got in. Um, let's see, I might actually just check as I'm doing this. Uh, no word yet. I'd hope so. We've only got a few days. Sometimes in the FA Cup games, especially, they would leave it a little bit long. But I've uh, got my train booked, got my um, hotel uh, outside town I had to get. It's mobbed. Obviously, a lot of people going up for that game. Um, Spurs. If the Spurs fans travel as they did to Fulham, I know it's a lot of a longer journey. Um, that's going to be brilliant for Spurs. They need that that noise that honestly I cannot overstate how impressive the, the away fans were the Spurs fans they were brilliant um so yeah there we go and now I can't think about Brian uh, I can't get out of my head Brian Hill potentially leaving the more I've spoken about it and it makes you wonder whether the Zaniolo stuff which initially earlier today I thought with the Danjuma um move it looked like Zaniolo maybe was potentially off the table but then maybe if Brian Hill does end up going, maybe you do have to look at someone like that as well. It may not end up being Zanioli. I know there's AC Milan interest as well. Um, and also Roma wanting a certain amount uh, for him. But especially if Spurs are trying to get Porro as well. But, you know, you do wonder. You do wonder with the Brian Hill situation. I guess he's absolutely put that in my head, reminding me about the Champions League uh, non-locally trained Player numbers absolutely changes a lot of things. It does. But there you go. I shall ponder that further. Um, and we'll have 
hopefully more more answers next video so like i say christian selenius press conference on friday uh preston away at six o'clock on saturday and yeah and then some very interesting games to come obviously city at home um spurs maybe well hopefully looking for a bit of revenge after that game and maybe you'd think with some new players as well to be able to uh, get in that squad should be i don't think they'll just stop at uh, Dan Juma at all I don't think that has ever been the plan just to bring in the one like I say it was as I said from the start an attacker and a right wing back was always the idea uh, the priority and then I guess you then react to anyone that goes out the door so yeah we shall see what it brings but I think that was a bit more of a positive video which is good there's still a lot of frustrations underlying um, you know still a lot of angry people out there I see them all the time um but it's nice to have a win, however it came. It's nice to have a new signing to talk about as well. Hopefully that will uh, get announced and confirmed during these two days off I have coming up. Um, ahead of a busy run. I don't think I then have another day off for almost a week, I think, after that. Um, but yeah, it's all worth it if Spurs are, are doing good things. Um, so yeah, I'm going to head off now enjoy my evening, um, hopefully. And uh, same to all of you. Um, as always, stay healthy, stay safe, look after yourselves, and I shall catch you later. Goodbye.